The Hyde Street Pier, Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco. A dock that houses a collection of preserved vessels from centuries past. Docked here is the glorious sailing ship Balclutha, the giant steam tug Hercules, and the huge car ferry Eureka. But the pier's most interesting vessel, in my opinion, is actually one of its more overlooked. That little paddle wheel steam tug there is called Eppleton Hall, and she is the last of her kind left in the world. As her stern clearly states, she comes from Newcastle, England. One has to wonder, how on earth did this little tug get here? Surely she didn't chug all the way across the world to come here, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that she did indeed, and the tale is quite an adventurous one. I'm going to tell you all the whole thing, from old Eppie's beginnings, her rescue from the breaker's yard, and her incredible voyage across the Atlantic to America's west coast. This is the story of Eppleton Hall, the most courageous tug in the world. The River Tyne in England. The first ever vessels built specifically for towing emerged here in the early 1800s, over 200 years ago. It was this river that nursed an industry that would revolutionize the conduct of maritime commerce. The birth of the tugboat. In 1814, in the days when steam was making its prepubescent appearance on the seas, the first tug emerged with steam-powered paddle wheels on its sides. The tug was simply named the Tyne Steamboat, later renamed Perseverance, and it was the first of its kind, a Tyne Paddle Wheel Steam Tug. Much like how a tractor can spin itself in place by turning its treads in opposite directions, the giant paddle wheels on each side, each independently operated by their own engines, made turning the vessel around incredibly easy and this versatility made the paddle wheel tugs very desirable for narrow river work, shuffling barges and docking ships on the river time. These paddle wheelers were the first ever successful tugboat design. Hundreds of these designs continued to be built over the course of the century by Heppel & Company in South Shields near Newcastle. Our Eppleton Hall was one of the last paddle wheelers built by the company, erecting in 1914. She was one of the last built, and the second to last ever in service. Eppleton Hall, now affectionately known as the Epi for short, was built to the order of Lambton and Hetton Collieries to tow coal ships and barges in and out of their port on the nearby River Weir. She was named after the Eppleton Hall, the Lambton family's in central house in Penshaw, Sunderland. She really was a beautiful piece of ship craftsmanship with a large, unique, ornate wooden wheelhouse, and a black stack with three horizontal red stripes. She served Lambton for a good 30 years. In 1945, she was sold to the tugboat company France Fenwick, Weir, and Time Limited, where she was repainted to carry the company's livery, a teal hull, yellow superstructure, and a stack with blue and white vertical stripes, complete with the France Fenwick's anchor insignia. Over the years, her wheelhouse was cut down to a much smaller one without a roof covering. In 1952, she obtained a passenger certificate to carry officials to and from newly built ships on the time. The glory days of the paddle wheel tugs were quickly reaching their end. Now in the 1960s, a good 150 or so years since the birth of the side paddle wheeler, those remaining were all being scrapped. In November 1964, the France Fenwick disposed the last of theirs. Epi was miraculously spared the scrapyard and sold off to her final owner, the CM Harbor Dock Company, south of Newcastle. Here she worked alongside her sister, Time Paddle Wheeler, Reliant. At this point in time, Epi and Reliant were the last two working Time Paddle steamers in the world and were fairly popular with steam enthusiasts for this. Both were repainted in the CM livery, keeping her yellow superstructure, but now with a red hole and a black stack with a horizontal red stripe. 
Epi and Reliant spent their twilight years at the sleepy harbor of Siam. Only three years after transferring, and after a hearty 53 years of working service, Eppleton Hall was finally withdrawn and sold to a breaker's yard for scrapping in 1967. The poor little tug met a sad end when she was grounded and then set ablaze to make breaking her apart easier. Her entire inside was gutted and top deck ruined, leaving an empty hole to rust away on a mud bank in Dunstan. Old Epi had seemingly met her end and awaited the tide to have its way with her. So, how the hell did she get to San Francisco? The story of Eppleton Hall's preservation and journey to the States is a crazy one, and it all came to be because a flamboyant, idealistic San Francisco man named Scott Newhall wanted a tugboat. By 1968, Epi had been written off as scrap. Reliant, meanwhile, was still chugging away at Seam. Reliant was crowned the title of the last remaining time paddle steam tug in the world, as she was still in one piece, floating and fully operational. So it came as quite the shock when Seam announced their plans to sell the tug off. She was promised to the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, London, who planned to turn her into a static display inside their museum. News of this sale reached the States, and fell on the ears of the then director of the San Francisco Maritime Museum, Carl Cortum. Carl informed San Francisco Chronicle executive editor, museum trustee, and close friend Scott Newhall, who basically responded to the news with a hearty, Oh hell nah! Now you see, Carl and Scott were not professional mariners, but both were experienced yachtsmen and huge maritime buffs. They knew how important the Tyne paddle steamers were to the history of the tugboat industry. The Tyne had given birth to the tugboat, and the paddle wheelers were the first ever successful design. To them, it was imperative that one example survived to preserve that history. After hearing of Greenwich's plans to basically break apart and stuff the last existing one into an exhibit, Carl and Scott immediately took action. You know, Scott said to Carl, we can steam that tugboat here ourselves. It would make for a splendid exhibit in your maritime museum. Scott hopped on a plane to Newcastle to strike up a deal to purchase Reliant himself. When he arrived, he offered the gentleman at Seam a better deal, but to no avail. It's a pity, said Mr. Hudson, the secretary of the Seam Dock Company, that you didn't come a year ago. We sold Eppleton Hall to a shipbreaker then, and you could have had her. She is all gone by now. Scott eventually wrote a letter to Greenwich's curator, making an offer for them to take Eppleton Hall instead and make a static display of her, and leave the intact reliant for him to sail to San Francisco, and offering to pay the difference. The curator rather rudely replied to him laughing in his face, and called him silly for thinking a tug of reliant size could even survive the journey. Scott was determined to save reliant so determined that he went as far as to hire two actors to pose as Greenwich representatives to swindle the tug out of Seaham. Seaham was wise to the scheme, and the plan was quickly foiled once Scott and Yard got involved. Three times rejected, Scott gave it up. But he didn't want to return to the States empty-handed. Q. Eppleton Hall. Scott went to Dunstan to inspect the tug's remains. To his surprise, she was mostly intact. While he would have preferred a tug that was in one piece, a tug that was mostly in one piece would have to do. On that June night, an exhausted Scott Newhall phoned the breaker's yard from his room at the Royal Turks Head Hotel and purchased Epi. Eppleton Hall would steam again. The purchase of Eppleton Hall was in June. Scott did extensive research on making the route to San Francisco, which would take them down the west coast of Europe and Africa, across the Atlantic, through Panama Canal, and up the west coast of North America. The best time to sail was in September, timing perfectly to leave before the foul weather in the North Sea and arriving after hurricane season in the Caribbean. If Epi was going to leave for the States that year, 
they had to be ready to go in September. They had a total of three months to restore the derelict Eppleton Hall to not only just working condition, but in a condition worthy enough to traverse an ocean crossing. Quite a mighty ask, but Scott was determined to get his tug home. Scott got in touch with an ex-steamanship sailor named Bill Bartz, who took on the task to restore the tug with great enthusiasm. Effie was refloated and brought to a small shipyard near Newcastle, and here the restoration process began. Bill and his team worked tirelessly to restore the old girl. She became quite a sight for steam enthusiasts, who came in droves to pay respect to the men's efforts to steam her again. To make an ocean crossing, Eppleton Hall would need a ton of work and additions. Her entire gutted hull section was completely rebuilt to accommodate quarters for the 12-man crew. She was given a brand new wooden wheelhouse, which was salvaged from a fishing trawler. Scott specifically wanted a covered one similar to her original, to allow the steersmen comfort and shelter for the many hours they'd be at the wheel. Steamships were quickly being phased out, and many of the ports on the journey were not supplying coal anymore so her coal-fired boilers were replaced with oil-burning ones. And lastly, she was given two giant sailing masts on her bow and stern, so she could sail when the wind was strong and conserve her fuel. The total restoration work cost about $150,000 in 1969 money. As she was technically fitted as a sailing ship, she affectionately received the title SS, making her temporarily the SS Eppleton Hall for her crossing. The Board of Trade were not too happy about issuing a small tug with a certification for a transatlantic voyage. However, her new owners made the case that although Eppleton Hall may have once been a tug, and still looked like a tug, all her new additions made her actually a private yacht. And in those days, private yachts didn't need Board of Trade certifications to sail. They just barely won the case, and Epi received the green light to cross officially registered as a private yacht in Carl Corton's name. After an absolutely exhausting three months of non-stop work, Eppleton Hall was complete, and in the classy livery she originally wore as a Lambton tug. However, with the blue and white striped stack and anchor insignia of the France Fenwick, she was ready for her voyage across the Atlantic. She had her sea trials a week before departure, which proved to be successful. At 1 o'clock p.m., September 18, 1969, Eppleton Hall blew her whistle as she steamed away from the River Tyne for the final time, bound for San Francisco. Old sailors and supporters aboard ships and docks surrounded her in the harbor, cheering her as she departed. Their long, 11,000-mile, six-month voyage had begun. Eppie's crew was made up of 12 people, hand-picked by Scott himself. Scott Newhall was captain of the vessel, with Carl Cortum as his first mate and chief officer. Along with Carl came his 11-year-old son Johnny, who was titled as the ship's boy. The second mate and navigator was Scott's nephew Christopher Waldo, or Kip for short. Third mate was Bill Bartz, the man who oversaw Eppie's restoration, and he brought along his 16-year-old daughter Heidi, and 17-year-old son Billy, who both helped out on deck. The chief engineer was Scott Nicole, who was the only man in the San Francisco area that Scott knew of with experience with steam engines. Second engineer was 20-year-old Max Derny, Carl's nephew, and the third engineer was Rich Childress. The last two crew members were the cooks, Francie Neal and Jeanne Marie Mayer, who were both very close friends. Epi made good progress at first, they had a strong first week, but the second proved to be strenuous. They hit a gale heading down the English Channel, causing a problem with one of her fuel pumps. She was forced back to Dover for repairs. She was away again on the 28th, and made good progress along the French coast until they experienced bad weather in the Bay of Biscay. They had to stop in their tracks and wait the storm out. The voyage was delayed for several days. So much so that the poor tug ran out of fuel on October 4th, stranded in the middle of the ocean. 
Not exactly the type of trouble you want to land yourself in, in only the second week of your six month voyage. Desperate for help, Bill and Carl used one of Epi's lifeboats to row over to a passing cruise ship and flag them down, only to be turned away because the ship had only enough fuel to get itself to the next port of call. The crew put out a distress call on the radio for assistance. Several days passed, waiting in agony to be rescued. Eventually, on the evening of the third day of being stranded, a cargo ship called the Cervantes came along to the tug's rescue. The ship topped her off enough to get her to the next port of call. The crew of the Cervantes invited Epi's crew on board for a meal and a hot shower. Scott claims that that day was the most rewarding day of possibly his entire life. After that huge scare, they were off again. On October 8th, they had reached the coast of Portugal, and on October 10th, stopped in Lisbon. The next port of call was Funchal on the Madeira Islands. She sailed smoothly into port there, and rested for two days. They continued south towards the Canary Islands off of Spain. They arrived in Las Palmas, and here the tug had its longest stop on the voyage. The trip was not going as smoothly as planned. Epi was suffering bothersome mechanical issues left and right, and some of the crew were getting frustrated with the slow progress of the journey. Scott Nicall, the chief engineer, announced he had to return home to San Francisco to take care of personal affairs. He explained that Epi was traveling so slow that by the time they reached San Francisco, there'd be no personal affairs left for him. GM Mayer, one of the stewards, had to return as well due to illness. Two down, leaving a crew of ten left. So things were not looking so hot for the crew as she left the Canaries that night on November 9th and headed south for Cape Verde Islands. The cruise to Mendeo was fortunately very pleasant, and they were welcomed warmly into Porto Grande. The biggest and most frightening leg of the journey was next, the Atlantic Crossing. Mendeo was the staging area for Eppleton Hall's assault on the Atlantic. Here she was readied for the longest and most strenuous passage of her entire journey. 3,000 miles of wide, open ocean stood between her and Georgetown, Guyana. Scott feared a repeat of the fuel disaster in the Bay of Biscay, and saw to it that Epi was loaded to the brim with extra fuel drums to ensure a straight crossing. On Sunday, November 23rd, a fully loaded Eppleton Hall, squatting deep in the water, sloshed out to sea for Georgetown. They were very lucky, for the skies were clear, the ocean was flat, and the winds were blowing in their favor. But the weather was hot, and the moving was slow. The first few days at sea were a real slog. The crossing was described as sometimes a comfortable cruise, and sometimes a purgatory. The Eppleton Hall eventually settled into her daily routine at sea. The crew became so used to the constant beat of the grasshopper engines that it was disorienting when they were stopped. At approximately in the mid-Atlantic, Epi's engines were both duly christened with names on the crossheads of their main piston rods. The port side named Nip, and the starboard side named Tuck. Nip and Tuck. It was quite ironic that not long after the naming ceremony, Nip decided to have problems. The crew were wise to Epi's mechanical issues by this point, and they indeed managed to fix it quickly and confidently. Only four hours of hurried repair work had passed before the Eppleton Hall was steaming on her way again. They spent Thanksgiving at sea. On December 5th, they received a Mayday distress call on the radio. A Swedish fishing trawler called the Skold suffered engine trouble and was stranded at sea. Eppleton Hall was too far away and did not have enough fuel to reach her, but they managed to relay the message to a passing tramp steamer who saved the crew. The Scold was later found on the other side of the Atlantic months later, wrecked on a reef off one of the Antilles Islands. After an exhausting 21 days at sea, Eppleton Hall saw the land of Guyana ahead. On Sunday, December 14th, she limped into Georgetown. The longest and most dreaded leg of the journey was complete, with only about 90 miles worth of fuel left aboard her. Eppleton Hall had reached the New World. 
but she still had another 5,000 or so miles to go until she reached her new home. They stayed in Georgetown for five very wet and rainy days before continuing on their way. They hugged the coast of South America and slipped into the Serpent's Mouth Strait separating Trinidad and Venezuela and made their next stop at Port of Spain, Trinidad. The crew spent Christmas here. Four days later, Epi left Trinidad and continued her way towards Panama, with her next stops at the port of Willemstad in Curaçao, Cartagena, Colombia, and Cristobal, Panama. The Panama Canal awaited her. A storm occurred the day before reaching Panama Canal. Approaching the canal, Epi was greeted with the greatest hazard for a paddle wheel tug, floating debris. The canal company graciously loaned a tug with barges lashed on either side of it to clear a path for her and lead the way in. Through the series of locks she went, towed by the mules. Eppleton Hall, the first and last tine paddle tug to ever traverse the Panama Canal. A berth awaited her on the other side in Balboa, and here she rested before the journey up the west coast. She touched Pacific waters and went on her way north. Six days out of Panama, they made their first stop at Corinto, Nicaragua. She anchored in Corinto for five days, and while she laid at anchor, Bill Bartz repainted the entire tug. In fact, he repainted the entire tug a total of three times over the course of the whole voyage. What a bro. The next stop was in Salina Cruz, Mexico. En route, the ship's boy, Johnny, came down with a severe intestinal disorder. They stopped the boat on the shores of San Jose, Guatemala where Carl took him inland to the nearest hospital. He urged them to go without them, so they set sail again. Four of the original crew down now, eight left. They stopped in Salina Cruz, Mexico, and then Acapulco. They arrived in Acapulco Harbor just in time to see the finish of the San Diego Acapulco Yacht Race. After Acapulco was Manzanillo, where a large group of spectators crowded around them in port to see the English vessel, as well as Carl, Johnny had been sent back to the States to get better, while he came back to join the crew. They took on heaps of fuel and drums in Manzanillo for a straight run to San Diego, California. After Manzanillo, they hit the worst storm of the entire voyage. The poor Tyneside Queen was thrashed about in giant waves, everyone bracing themselves against the tug's tremendous plunges. They didn't bother wasting energy trying to guide the ship, as the wheel was lashed over. For several hours, the crew waited the storm out in agony, all more or less convinced this may be the Eppleton Hall's final hour. The wind eventually died down, and miraculously they managed to survive the storm. Quickly they turned to starboard and scraped into Mazatlan, Mexico. The shaking crew abandoned the straight run to San Diego and anchored up here for more fuel and a rest. Luckily, there was no serious damage to the tug, and by daybreak next day, she was on her way again, course set for California. With the exception of the Atlantic crossing, the next longest leg of the journey was from Mexico to San Diego. There were no large ports on the coast of Baja, California, none that they were aware of anyway, so taking on as much fuel as possible in Manzanillo was imperative. Even so, they still ran low as they traveled up the peninsula. It was absolute luck that they came across an old whaling rendezvous point in Turtle Bay, which very fortunately happened to have a cache of diesel oil there, upon a private fuel barge manned by a man simply called Gordo. They finally reached San Diego, Epi's first ever United States stop. Friends and family members of the crew awaited them here, including Johnny, who was all well again and joined them for the last leg of the voyage. While in San Diego, Epi was moored alongside the beautiful 1863-built sailing ship called Star of India. Out on the bay, she passed by the mothballed World War II aircraft carrier Bunker Hill. The tug's second officer, Kip Waldo, coincidentally had served on the carrier during the war in the Pacific. Small world. One final leg of the journey laid ahead the straight run to San Francisco. Epi steamed past Catalina Island and eagerly chugged away north, her new home awaiting her. The trek up the California coast went surprisingly smoothly. After five days at sea, Eppleton Hall circled the San Francisco lightship and turned east towards the bay entrance. 
however, was stopped in her tracks. It wouldn't be a San Francisco welcome without a greeting from Carl the Fog. For a very tense three hours, Epi was stuck at sea in fog so thick that the crew was blinded. The little tug fumbled about in the white abyss trying to find her way to the bay entrance. Out of the mist appeared a Coast Guard cutter called Alert, whose crew aboard shouted and cheered at Epi to keep going forward. The fog at last cleared. Point Benitas Lighthouse came into sight. People lined up on the rocks cheering them on. They paddled inland and two giant red towers majestically loomed into view beneath a patch of blue sky. They had made it to San Francisco. <music> Eppleton Hall had never paddled so fast nor flaunted her Edwardian charm with so much flair as she did when she sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge on March 24th, 1970. To say the welcome she received was warm would be an absolute understatement. A flurry of vessels paraded alongside her, hooting their horns and fireboats shooting water into the air in excitement. Epi did laps around the bay and spun herself in circles, hooting her whistle with victorious glee. She had made it. She finally glided into her berth at Fisherman's Wharf where thousands of San Franciscans greeted her, captivated by the remarkable achievement of what was once a breaker's yard derelict. TV reporters and journalists piled onto the tug as soon as she docked, and Scott braced himself for the onslaught. A reporter shouted immediately, How did a ship like this ever make it all the way from Newcastle to San Francisco? To that, Scott Newhall smiled and replied, Well, you see, it really is very simple. All you have to do is sail out of the Tyne and turn right. Six months later, when you arrive off the Golden Gate, just turn right again and you're in San Francisco. <music> Eppleton Hall had a busy first decade in San Francisco. She'd often be used to ferry people around the bay and give harbor tours. She was a pretty popular tourist attraction at Fisherman's Wharf. By 1979, her engines were worn and Scott Newhall decided it was time for old Epi to rest. In 1979, he decommissioned her and officially donated her to the San Francisco Maritime Museum. She was moored up at the Hyde Street Pier and has remained there ever since. 42 years later, and she is still afloat and can be visited today. This is the part of the video where I mentioned Tugs. Tugs was a short-lived British children's television series about anthropomorphic tugboats, created by the same people who made Thomas the Tank Engine, and was accomplished similarly using detailed models. The show's creators, Robert Cardona and David Mitten, paid visits to several American ports to gather inspiration. It was in 1987 when they paid San Francisco a visit, and witnessed old Epi for themselves. They were so intrigued by the paddler and her history that they wanted to turn her into a character on the series. The character was named OJ, short for Old Jones, and he was very similar to Eppleton Hall, sporting a yellow superstructure and a red stack with blue and white vertical stripes. Like Epi being the last paddler in the world, OJ was the last paddler in the big city port. Tugs didn't last very long, of course, but the character was a wonderful tribute to the real Tug itself. All the episodes of the series are on YouTube. I also did a big analysis video of the show that you should definitely check out if you haven't already. Since being moored, Epi has had a few cosmetic restorations. In the early 90s or so, she was repainted and converted into her France Fenwick guise with the smaller wheelhouse, as she still wears today. In 2014, they hauled her into dry dock for a full repaint in honor of her 100th birthday. Sadly, as Epi isn't a registered U.S. vessel, she isn't eligible for U.S. grants and will likely never steam again, unless someone with deep pockets comes along and wants to fork over the money. It's been over four decades since Eppleton Hall has moved on her own, which may seem like a sad existence for such a unique preserved vessel, but it's still a supremely more desirable fate than what happened to her sister, Reliant. In an absolutely ironic twist of fates, 
Reliant, the tug Scott Newhall wanted to purchase and preserve in the first place, got the short end of the stick. She was, quite literally, put inside the Greenwich Museum in full, and remained there on static display. By 1996, the tug was broken apart and only her superstructure was kept intact, the hull completely disused. In 2005, the remains of Reliant mysteriously disappeared. Greenwich had had the tug scrapped as a cost reduction measure, preserving only the engines and her paddle wheels, which are now on display in Greenwich and Doncaster respectively. This scummy action was met with much deserved uproar from enthusiasts. Greenwich had scrapped a preserved steam tug, the last of her kind left in the UK. An incredibly ironic twist of fate that the tug that was last intact and Scott fought so hard for was the one that ended up being scrapped. And the tug that was sold for scrap and left to rot in a breaker's yard is the one still alive and floating today. Funny how fate works, isn't it? There is one more paddle wheel tug in existence, sort of. The John H. Amos, built in Scotland. Amos is technically intact, but she isn't a tyne paddler, and she isn't exactly floating. Saved from the scrapyard, but not looked after, and the poor tug spent a good chunk of its preservation life sunk. In 2008, she was salvaged and now sits on a barge awaiting its fate. It's been there ever since, in a very rough condition. Her future is uncertain. Considering the other two paddle tugs either are not alive, and barely alive, our old Appleton Hall really did come out on top. The fact she is still intact and afloat today is truly remarkable. It's very unlikely she'll ever steam again in the near future. But hey, never say never. Anything is possible in the era of preservation. Appleton Hall may not be the most impressive looking vessel at the Hyde Street Pier, but to quote a famous space smuggler, it may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts. Despite all the odds against them from the very start, Scott Newhall and his team of very passionate people somehow managed to sail a tiny tug built for small river work across the world. And their courageous efforts have landed the Appleton Hall a rightful spot in maritime history and in my heart. The story of Eppie's journey is one of determination, dedication, and passion. Through the torch of the breaker's yard, through the toughest of storms, and over oceans of time, they made the impossible happen. If there's a lesson to take away from this story, it's that nothing is truly impossible if there's a will. If you all found this video interesting, then I highly, highly recommend seeking out the book, The Eppleton Hall, an accurate retelling of the tug's entire journey from Newcastle to San Francisco, written by Scott Newhall himself. This was the main source of information I used for this video. The amount of detail and trouble the little tug found herself in on her voyage is truly fascinating, a lot of which isn't online anywhere, and there's so much I intentionally did not mention in this video for those who'd like to give it a read. Scott Newhall was a newspaper editor, so the way the book is written is very theatrical and witty. I enjoyed it very much, it's a very fun read. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to the San Francisco Maritime Museum for their help on this video, who sent me a plethora of documents, photos, and footage from their archive for this. If you would like to donate to Epi's continued restoration or to just help out the museum in general, I provided a link in the description for where you can do that. Thank you all so much for watching everyone, and I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed this, because I sure as hell enjoyed making it. Long live the Appleton Hall.